I hope it will add to the, the town hall feel of the evening. Um, uh, I'm going to give a very brief introduction and then Peter is going to give an address on the points of British foreign policy and then we're going to open up to the floor for a Q&A. Um, firstly, I'd like to say to Peter that I'm extremely grateful uh, for him coming to address the Bay Group. I think I first invited you, Peter, to come along in 2011, 2012, something like that. Something like that. And uh, you asked me to um, destroy the Conservative Party and sort the ground on which it once stood. In terms of camera, I think, I, think we've done an, I think we've done an okay job. Um, and uh, I, I, I think I got you to admit, having debated with you, three or four times on university campuses that I wasn't all bad. So thank you for, mm. for giving for, <laughs> thank you for giving the highest praise that I've I've ever heard you give and, and thank you for being here. Whether you like it or not, um, you have been a huge inspiration for Conservative Small C. Yes. Um, you are greatly revered um, by by those in the boat group and um, as a public intellectual and philanthropist, we greatly appreciate the fact that you have been doggedly fighting the fight for so long. Um, today we're, we're going to talk about British foreign policy, which is one of your many interests, an issue which, um, in my opinion, you've also been right for a long time, unfashionably for most of that period, but more recently um, I think people are starting to see your reasoning. Um, we're going to talk about modern British foreign policy, but I would say that we could perhaps, based on your knowledge, refer back to uh, the, the period of the last few decades where I would argue we, Britain has entered into um, a different mode of foreign policy from realism and, and pursuing state interests, to realism being a, a, an international relations theory to, to suggest that uh, nations pursue their own power-defined interests to a period of, of neoliberal interventionism, which I would argue that neoconservatism is part of and is no different to. Um, and I think people are starting to wake up to that being a deeply problematic theory that has actually made the, the world um, a far more dangerous place. So um, if you could uh, give us your thoughts on where we are um, as a country in terms of foreign policy, but also perhaps where the, where the West is generally, and why you think that the, the neoliberal era has been such a failure. Did you do? Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Far too generous. I would put, put that right. I, first of all, I want to make it plain, I do not intend, and if anybody can't hear me, will they say so now, rather than coming up to me afterwards saying, I'm sure that was very interesting, Mr. Hitchens, but I couldn't hear a word because that's very irritating. If anybody can't hear me now, say so now. This is the volume at which I shall speak. I'm not proposing a long Fidel Castro type harangue, which I know will disappoint some of you. Uh, I propose to be fairly brief and concentrated and then to invite as many questions and challenges as people care to throw at me. Uh, let me begin with a story uh, which is to be found in a book which some of you may have read and all of you should have read called Orderly and Humane about the Potsdam Agreement and the terrible consequences of it in Central Europe between 1945 and 1950. The officers at a British army mess in occupied Berlin in 1945 observed one evening that at the back of their mess where the drain emptied out, women were scrabbling under the drain with pieces of dirty cloth trying to catch globs of fat in the drain water from their kitchen. On further inquiry, these women turned out to be German middle-class women who ten years before had lived comfortable lives in civilized suburbs and were now living in rags as refugees, straining Greece from the drain water of a British army mess. I think this is a useful illustration to all of us now of how short a distance there is between civilization, warfare, and the barbarism which follows it. And I think the immense smugness, arrogance, and self-confidence of some of our national leaders over the past 10 years, and in some cases longer, 
seems to me to be completely devoid of any sort of historical feeling about how their actions might affect the world and how things which we do in other people's countries may one day be done to us by others with the same level of institutional arrogance as we have shown in places such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and Syria. And that is the basis of my foreign policy, a very, very strong dislike of war, a very, very strong desire to avoid it, and a very, very strong contempt for those who think that it is a terribly good adventure. I mean, one thinks in that regard of people such as Hillary Benn and David Cameron and Anthony Blair and those who assisted him, but there are many, many people who assisted him who have not come before any kind of court of public opinion for what they did. And there may even be people here who believe in this. And it's with that in mind that I would like to first of all uh, attack very severely the foolish policy which this country has developed towards Russia. Yes. I, I stand in complete amazement at it. Now here again, uh, I have to tell you a story. I was a Moscow correspondent for what was then a newspaper, the Daily Express. <laughs> in 1990, 1991, and 1992, and therefore I was present at the end of communism, literally. In fact, although I was probably the most ignorant and unskilled correspondent in Moscow at the time, I was also one of the very few who was there on the day when communism actually fell, because all the rest were on holiday in the Adirondacks. <laughs> uh, there I was, and I was walking the streets of Moscow, uh, looking at what had happened after the fall of communism, one of the things I observed was this. Every single litter bin, in those days the central Moscow litter bin was in a rather ornate style, a large grey metal urn. Every single one of them had a column of smoke coming out of it. And when I observed closely these litter bins, I found that they were full of Communist Party membership cards. <laughs> <laughs> that is what had happened. Thousands and thousands of people who had joined the Communist Party because they wanted their children to get into university because they wanted to get a better apartment, because they wanted promotion, or because they merely wanted to keep their jobs. All those people have now recognized that communism, the thing which they hated, was over. And they did hate it. A few months before, I'd been in a cinema in northern Moscow uh, watching a film called Takjit Nizia, which to the shame of the BBC has never been shown uh, on British television. Uh, made by a man called Stanislav Galerikin, a friend of Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the film, uh, Takjit Nizia, the title of the film means roughly, we can't go on living like this. It was the first time that any filmmaker had ever been allowed by an actual decision of the Politburo to make a film about what it was really like to live in the Soviet Union. The corruption, the filth, the horrible prisons, the, the desecration of churches, the corruption, the, and also brief glimpses in the film of the Russia that had been lost uh, in, in the revolution, the one that Bolsheviks always lied about. And, and, said it had been, had been a terrible place of misery when compared with the thing they created it had been a paradise. And I noticed, I had an interpreter with me, my Russian wasn't that good, uh, I had an interpreter whispering in my ear the commentary and I noticed as she was doing so a sound all around me in the cinema. Everyone in that cinema was weeping because for the first time in their lives they had been told the truth about the, about the country in which they lived and the government under which they, under which they survived for the first time and they were all in tears. That was the state of that country. A few months later, by great privilege, I was able to go to the then closed city of Sevastopol uh, to see what was left of the Soviet Navy. Much of it was sunk, down by the bow, down by the stern, sunk, lying to one side, lying to the other. It was a ruined, scuttled, finished fleet. And this was the great navy which Admiral Sergei Gorshkov had built to challenge the US Navy's power and control over the seven seas, and it was dead. And over. So I know from direct personal experience, I know that the Soviet Union and Russia are not the same place. And yet I am surrounded by journalists and politicians who keep on telling me that Russia is as big a threat and the same threat as the Soviet Union, that those who even dare to suggest that our policy towards Russia is mistaken are useful idiots uh, to be compared with the, the disgraceful and in my view, criminal fellow travelers who apologized for the Soviet Union and its repressions during 70 years of tyranny. And I find myself astonished over and over and over again that in this country, 
it is a disadvantage to be well informed about any subject at all, and particularly this one. Let us take, just for instance, the episode over the Ukraine, which is always described in all parts of the media and by all politicians and in all debates as the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the Russian seizure of Crimea. I won't trouble you with all the details of the history of Crimea. I've written a very long blog posting on it, which is called A Brief History of Crimea, because it isn't, which all of you can look up. But the point that it makes in very, very briefly is that when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Ukraine government, of course, obtained its liberty from Moscow as a result of a referendum in which everybody voted not to be ruled by Moscow anymore. But when the people of Crimea tried to hold a referendum about whether they should be ruled by Ukraine anymore, the Ukrainian government intervened with threats of force to prevent it. That was in 1992. So it's an interesting piece of background knowledge in any discussion of who should own Crimea and who has title to it, which you should bear in mind in what follows. The events in Ukraine did not arise accidentally. Since the Nuremberg trials, which were principally about, uh, because let me explain something. A lot of the things which the Germans did could not be prosecuted at Nuremberg because we had done them too. And, or the Soviets had certainly done them too. And the principal charges against many of the defendants were this, waging aggressive war. And since 1945, the waging of aggressive war, except on the part of the United States, has been illegal internationally. It's illegal for the USA as well, but they ignore it because nobody can stop them. Therefore, if you wish, in any part of the world, to take an aggressive step towards a country which is uh, which you feel is is in your way or not aligned in the correct way, you do not invade it. You arrange for people power <coughs> demonstrations to take place. Uh, you arrange for people to camp in the middle of the town with bonfires. You, I, I, I am a former Trotskyist. I can, can't even begin to tell you how complicated it is to organize a spontaneous demonstration. <laughs> and there they were, in their thousands, demonstrating spontaneously in the middle of Kiev, and the, and the world media thought it was an accident or a real upsurge of popular feeling. And if you believe that, answer me, any of you, how do you pitch a tent in the middle of a stone-paved square? Anybody know? Of course you don't. No, you need organization to know that. You need lots and lots of styrofoam blocks to pitch it on. And that's what they had, mysteriously enough, just as a few years before they'd all had orange flags. How did they hit on orange? Anyway, these, these demonstrators surrounded the government and demanded with increasing, uh, increasing urgency the removal of a government which, for all its faults, and there were many of them, had actually been legitimately elected in an election which the results of which nobody really contested. Those demonstrators were encouraged openly by Senator John McCain, uh, by Catherine Ashton, High Representative for Foreign Policy of the European Union, by Victoria Newland, Assistant Secretary of State in the Washington government of Barack Obama, uh, by Guido Westerwelle, the recently retired Foreign Minister of the Federal Republic of Germany, and by many, many other prominent figures from the West. Imagine, if you will, how during if during the Scottish independence referendum, Russian politicians had turned up in Edinburgh and Glasgow urging people to vote to secede from the United Kingdom. Just imagine the response. And they were openly, quite openly, Western politicians urging these people to overthrow a legitimate government. This, ladies and gentlemen, was a putsch. Straightforwardly, undoubtedly, beyond any question, a putsch. And when it actually turned, it did violent. And there is no question that it turned violent because large numbers of policemen on record were killed, uh, many of them by firearms. When it turned violent and when the, the legitimate president fled the country and when the, an, an inquirate uh, Ukrainian parliament ignored the provisions of the Ukrainian constitution over impeachment and put, put in power a new president, it became absolutely a putsch. And it's amazing how many people, particularly Americans who place great value on constitutionality and legality, were perfectly happy to accept this, this, this creation of a government by putsch in Ukraine. And the achievement of this is very important, and it followed the spending of many, 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 many millions of euros and dollars on civil society organizations to obtain the result. The achievement of this was to move Ukraine from being a non-aligned country which Russia was prepared to accept as, a, 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 as reasonable and always had been, into being a country aligned with NATO and the European Union, thanks to the 
the political and military clauses in the association agreement which the new government immediately signed. Don't take my word for it, take the word of Michael Mosbacher writing in Standpoint magazine, a person who's no political friend of mine, but who absolutely emphatically uh, admits and accepts that this is a political change, foreshadowed in a book called The Grand Chessboard by Zbigniew Brzezinski, who points out the huge importance of Ukraine on the, on the European chessboard as a, first of all, as a huge advantage to anybody who holds it, who isn't Russia, and a huge disadvantage to Russia if anybody else holds it. It's, it's crucial. And if, you, if you move away from the so Wilfred Owen, Tommy-centric, Dunkirk version of World War I and World War II, and look and see what actually happened, you will notice that both World War I and World War II were fought over Ukraine. That was the principal area of battle and the principal area which Germany was attempting to take control of, and I might add, uh, the Crimea and the Caucasus. This is war. And the Russians didn't start it. Why would they start it? Their gross domestic product is the size of Italy's. Uh, their armed forces are one-tenth of the size of NATO's. Uh, they are economically decrepit. Uh, they have actually voluntarily given up 500,000 square miles of territory since the collapse of the Soviet Union without a shot being fired. They don't have ambitions in that direction. If they did, they don't have the weapons to enforce them. It's absurd to suggest that this is an aggressive action. As for Crimea, if you've been there, which I recommend you all to go because it's very beautiful, you'll find that it is Russian. The people living there are Russian, Russian is spoken, they're not, they, they, they resented being ruled from Ukraine, and it's to Russians the, the re entry of Crimea into the Russian Federation is very similar to the recapture of the Falkland Islands by British troops in 1982 is to us. That is the way they view it, and I personally rather sympathize. And it's also the view of the Crimeans. And had there been a truly independent referendum in Crimea about the, about the re-entry into Russia in 2014, which there wasn't, but had there been one, I am absolutely certain that it would have voted for re-entry to Russia, which I, if Ukraine can be independent from, from Moscow by virtue of a referendum, why can't the same rules apply to Crimea? So I, that, there are many other aspects of this, including the extraordinary parallel with Turkey, whose occupation and seizure of northern Cyprus is almost an exact parallel to the Crimea, and which, is, and, and, and which has never affected Turkey's NATO membership or led to any sanctions against Turkey, and the very, very peculiar position of Kosovo. But the moralizing and misleading and ignorance that is talked about this is endless, and I find it, I find it offensively stupid to anybody of any intelligence and education. And I'm astonished by how many people who ought to know better in the media and in politics accept it. And then there is a linked issue, and it is linked, because uh, the, the intervention of Russia in this is crucial. The issue of the Syrian war. I began to get, very early in the Syrian war, uh, emails from a British woman living in Latakia, married to a Syrian Muslim, not a, not a, a um, fanatical Islamist, just an ordinary human being saying that uh, she was watching reports on BBC World Service and they were wholly incorrect. They showed films of places uh, which they claimed to be in which they weren't. Uh, they even had the weather wrong. And they were not mentioning the fact that, the, that this was very early in the matter, that large numbers of, of jihadis with chinless beards and, and, and non-Syrian Arab accents were appearing in the country heavily armed. And what was going on again was a, was a, a non-state action, a non-invasion invasion, an attempt to destabilize we all know, backed by, the, by certain countries in the Gulf and also by Britain uh, and France and by the United States, uh, to overthrow what was a horrible uh, but legitimate government. Now, I just a brief disposition here on horrible governments. I'm as much against horrible governments as you are. I don't like them. Uh, but I think that it is idle for the British government to claim to be emotionally engaged about the Syrian government when it has such good relations with the People's Republic of China. Uh, which, uh, which now doesn't just jail dissidents, but jails lawyers who represent dissidents, uh, whose, whose dissidents often, often die in custody, uh, which kidnaps from Hong Kong and other independent territories, which kidnaps people who offend it, which is currently engaging on a program of ethnic cleansing and crushing of the Uyghurs of Xinjiang, which makes South African apartheid look relatively gentle. This country, uh, this country, when its, when its president comes to London, he is welcomed to Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. The police 
are set to, to, to keep him from any sight of any demonstrators protesting about his country's unlawful seizure of Tibet. And indeed, pro-Tibet demonstrators are violently driven from the streets and locked up without, without lawful excuse, uh, on, presumably on the behest of the Chinese authorities. That's what we do with China. In the Middle East, we are on very good terms with Bahrain, which is, which is any Amnesty International court will tell you is guilty of, of torture and of savage repression of its, of, 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 of its Shia people. And there we have a naval base. Uh, and then you must turn to Egypt, the country which no one dare criticize, where no one is even allowed to say that, that General Sisi is in power because of a military coup. Uh, this is a government which gunned down on the streets of Cairo thousands of people uh, in, in straightforward, old-fashioned, 19th century Gatling gun repression. And we do not protest. We maintain good di diplomatic relations with them. The United States continues to subsidize them almost as heavily as it subsidizes the state of Israel. That is the state of our morality in foreign policy, and therefore, since this moral objection to tyranny is not consistent, it cannot be the genuine reason for our policy. It simply cannot, and it is not, and you have to realize that. So let's put to one side the question of whether the Assad regime is nasty. It's nasty. I've, uh, I, I've got articles on record going back 14 years on how nasty it is, and I, I can't be faulted on that. That's not the point. The point is that what was being attempted was was to shore up and strengthen uh, the Sunni side in a Sunni-Shia conflict, which is now becoming far more important than the Arab-Israel conflict as the principal struggle in the Middle East, in which Britain, for some reason, has decided to take the side of the country I didn't mention, which is probably the most repressive in the world, namely Saudi Arabia, our ally and friend, uh, to whose capital our royal family and principal politicians almost weekly repair there to be decorated with a, with a, a medal, uh, the king something or other medal, which is hung around their necks and they bow while it's hung around their necks and there are pictures of them all doing it if you look. And this government, these people, claim to have a moral imperative in Syria. They don't. The, the, the imperative is otherwise. And when Russia frustrated very effectively that policy, the attempt to, to incommode and undo and damage Russia and Europe intensified, which I do not think was necessarily entirely coincidental. And we have here a struggle which, from which our leaders do not learn. They didn't understand Iran or Afghanistan, and they made a mess of them. They, they failed completely in Libya uh, to do what they had intended to do, and turn <coughs> Libya from a reasonably orderly repressive state which controlled immigration across the Mediterranean into a cauldron of fire and blood, uh, which is unable to control the Mediterranean migration. And is, that action, mainly by David Cameron, is one of the principal reasons for the migration crisis in Europe. And then we intervene with equal ignorance and stupidity in Syria. And people support it. People support it because they say, they're, you ask public opinion, public opinion says it's, it's in favor of overthrowing the tyranny of Bashar al-Assad. And one despairs. Why is it? I don't. I simply do not understand why intelligent, educated people in politics and the media fall for this stuff. It doesn't take much of an effort. And I ask you, who presumably are here because you hope to be in some way influential in politics or decision making of some kind, to bear in mind what I've said tonight and remember that it might one day be you, or the, or, or, or the women in your life if you're men, who are groveling behind some Chinese army mess, straining the grease out of the drains, because that's the only way you're going to get any cooking fat tonight. Um, to, to make a brief point, the burning of the Communist Party membership cards, I think is exactly the reason why um, or the, or the, the motivation for holding those cards is exactly the same as the reticence in the Westminster establishment to address the sort of issues you were talking about. Um, and I think this is... I, have you been accused of being KGB, FSB? Not to my face by somebody I could sue, no. Right. <laughs> well, well, I, I, in the usual slimy places where you can say that kind of thing and get away with it, yeah. I, I had the the, the rare pleasure of, of joining Nigel Farage and, and Donald Trump 
Um, oh, this was a week. You're welcome to that. This was, <laughs> this was a week before uh, the US presidential election where it was assumed that Clinton was going to win and we were going to go to proxy war with Russia in Syria. Um, the atmosphere was free for all. Um, I made the point that we had absolutely no British interest at stake in such a war um, and was subsequently accused of literally being a Russian agent <laughs> along with uh, Trump, Steve Bannon, all sorts of other figures. Well, well obviously, so, may I just stop you for a moment? The, the nature of Soviet society is perhaps not fully understood by people anymore because it has been gone for so long. But to compare uh, the pressures on people here of the kind that you describe with the pressures on people in the Soviet system uh, to conform is to be, I think, very unkind to the Soviet people. They had to endure a, 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 a pressure to conform on them which was incredibly strong. This was a, this was a unified, universal, omnipresent state which could destroy your life completely. Uh, to, from which there was no recourse. You couldn't go to any newspaper and say, I'm being treated this way. You couldn't go to any court and put anything right. You couldn't even speak openly about it. There was nothing. It was the state and it was you. And I think that people in this country do not, simply do not have anything remotely resembling that excuse. There may be slanders and various other kinds of things which could be leveled against you, but they are not to be compared with the apparatus of a repressive <coughs> police state with a committee of state security. You, well, quite, and the death counts. Um, well, the death, and death counts had gone by the time, by that time, but it, it wasn't, it was, the, it was the ability to ruin your life, you know, to, to destroy your children's education, to, to, to make sure you lived somewhere filthy and miserable for the rest of your days, to, to, to in general, make you utterly miserable without any kind of redress which they have. Uh, the, the, the gulag had pretty much gone long before then, though there was a problem with psychiatry, which is another question, but it was not, it, it didn't need to be that bad still to be much, much worse than anything we have here. But you must have experienced um, fellow journalists, uh, politicians, commentators, who privately perhaps sympathize with some of the things you were saying, but were not willing to. I noticed it. No, but well, I, I, I have noticed it. There are a large number of, of members of parliament that I've spoken to who are not willing to say this sort of stuff publicly, but are very sceptical privately. And my point is not that they fear being sent to the gulag, but they fear loss of position, which is a far less onerous um, thing. But nonetheless, yeah, but there is they, a climate If they fear. stood up in numbers, then they wouldn't face loss of position. And one of the one of the things about resolve is that it is is that if you if you do it effectively, then people will 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 stand with you. You in a in a in a in a, in a free and open society, you 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 have to stand up. There's no point saying I'm too scared to speak, because there might be 60 other people who are too scared to speak who would get up if you did, and then after which it would be impossible for the whips to do anything about it. For instance, you you mentioned the opinion polls um, since the. The disastrous, I would argue, interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq. There has certainly been a rise in scepticism towards these sorts of. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. There's a rise. If somebody came up and said, "Syria's got weapons of mass destruction," people say, "We've heard that one before." <laughs> but if they're told that Yemeni Putin wants to invade Lithuania, they believe it like a shot. They've 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 learnt to disbelieve the propaganda of the past, but they still are fooled by the propaganda of the present every time. They'll know. Once they've been got into a war with Russia and it's all gone wrong, they'll know that that stuff about Lithuania was round objects, but they don't know it now. They have to wait to find out. So no, WMD, you'll never be able to use that one again. You just have to think of a new one, and that's what they do. So, and it works. Uh, there, there has been um, uh, uh, an environment among the political and media establishment where um, anyone who speaks out on these sorts of issues in the way that you have is attacked, you're regularly attacked uh, for having what were up until very recently unfashionable views, and so I would imagine you have a thick skin for it. But I'm keen to hear from someone uh, from the audience who has, uh, who perhaps shares Peter's view or the view that um, Britain, Britain's intervention 
um, against uh, Russia or other states um, in, in proxy war in the Middle East is unwise, but have felt uncomfortable about holding that view because of the political waters in which they swim. Don't feel uncomfortable. You know, um, I've got a good view. Uh, well, if we if if we could just, me, if, we, if we could just limit it to one, because I think people are going to be quite. Okay, it's both related to Russia. Uh, the first one is: um, Do you think that the Russian government should have invaded Syria in order to um, destabilize Europe with all the mass immigration? Do I do I think Russia is invading Syria in order, in, in order to destabilize Europe? Uh, is the question? I think yes. Uh, no. Um, the destabilization of Syria was, was done before Russian intervention. Russian intervention has been very expensive for Russia, which hasn't got very much money. Uh, and it's also been expensive in lives uh, and in risk. And it was done, I think, probably quite unwillingly. A lot of the things which, which Vladimir Putin has done have been done unwillingly and reluctantly. He's not by any means some sort of gung-ho, let's invade everything person. He's very cautious. He has to worry very considerably about the nationalists, fanatics in his own circle, who are much, much more frightening than he is, uh, as well about the fact that his economy is in big trouble because it relies on oil and arms sales, and neither are doing particularly well. So it's not, it, 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 it's not Russia, Russia's intervention in Syria, so-called, was actually a <coughs> protection of an existing position. Russia inherited its position in Syria from the Soviet Union, but it inherited that because Russia, if you look at a map, has very, very strong links with and needs to take very much more of a close interest in the Middle East than a country like this one, which is nowhere near the Middle East. And Russia borders Iran, effectively, across the, and, 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 is, and is, 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 is therefore intimately involved in all that happens there and has a historic interest there. The, the, the extraordinary difference in this is that the Soviet policy in the Middle East was hugely anti-Israel, whereas the Russian policy in the Middle East is, is very pro-Israel. Until, until recent events over Iran, uh, there had been a very considerable closeness between Israel and Russia, which would have been unprecedented in the past. And there's another example of how Russia is not the Soviet Union. But the Syrian interest is simply they don't want to have some kind of uh, jihadi, uh, fanatical Sunni regime that close to their southern borders. Uh, that, is, that, that is a legitimate interest. And they've not invaded Syria. They've sent an actually quite small detachment of troops and not very many aircraft there to influence the, uh, the war. The people who have been much, much more prominent in intervening in terms of sending large numbers of troops have been the Iranians. And of course, Hezbollah, who have provided most of the actual on the ground muscle for, this, for the Syrian government's defeat of the jihadists uh, around Damascus and in Aleppo. So it's, it's not a Russian invasion. And it didn't, have any, it didn't have any European intent at all. It was taken in, 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 in Russia's interest. And also because Russia was extremely angry uh, over what had been done in Libya, uh, where it had been assured that this was just going to be a humanitarian intervention. And therefore, it didn't need to go to the United Nations and wasn't vetoed. And it then turned out to be the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime, which they had not wanted, which they thought, rightly in my view, was foolish. And they were not having that again. Uh, so when it arose again in Syria, they, they did what they could to stop it and, uh, and, and undo uh, the pro-Saudi strategy of the Western countries. OK, Madam, if there's time, we'll come back to the second one. Yes, sir. Peter, you're, on Ru uh, Russia, you're putting across an empathetic view of the needs of the Russian uh, nation in terms of foreign policy, that uh, we uh, can have a very angry central view of this and we're not being thoughtful enough to, to, the, to the genuine needs of Russia in terms of foreign policy. Uh, but trying to uh, disentangle that from the, uh, the untruthfulness of the Kremlin on a whole range of uh, issues, uh, is a uh, problem of presentation here. How can we get a disentangle a Kremlin, which is highly corrupt, which uh, lies uh, for several times before breakfast and a lot of times after that, from these needs of Russia as a, an entity which uh, has legitimate needs for protection? No, foreign policy has almost no link to our opinions of the internal regime involved. That's the point I was trying to make with China. 
China lies all the time. China is repressive. Uh, chi China is actually more repressive than Russia. So is Turkey, our NATO ally. Turkey has far more journalists in jail than Russia does, for instance. And uh, I, would, I would say its, it's, it's, it's current career towards uh, despotism is, is, is far more uh, dangerous than Putin's because, it, because the man in charge, uh, Mr. Erdogan, is so capricious. And uh, I, I would go no further than that. So it's not a question of the internal regime. I'm not here to defend Vladimir Putin, who I say regularly, and I will say here again, is a sinister tyrant. I'm no friend of theirs. His, uh, his spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, won't take my phone calls. I don't, uh, they don't regard me as a friend, and I don't regard them as friends. I'm the, my point is the British point. Why are, we, why are we working towards some kind of war or conflict with this country? I don't think any of you are old enough to remember what used to be the most brilliant satirical uh, uh, column in the British press, the Peter Simple column in the old Daily Telegraph, when the Daily Telegraph was still a newspaper, but uh, he, the, one, of the, one of the many running jokes he had uh, was a war between Sweden and Yugoslavia, which could never take place because the two sides couldn't find each other. Uh, and this is roughly this is what, what would a war between Russia and Britain be about? We have, no, we have no frontier, we have no territorial waters in which we necessarily meet. Uh, we barely trade with each other. Uh, most British people couldn't find Russia on a map. Uh, it's probably unusual. Uh, why are we having, what, what, is, what is our dispute with Russia? Uh, is, is there something about the Hebrides or, or, or what is it that would cause us to be at war with Russia? We have no national interest whatsoever. We have as much so, interest in a war so with so Russia so as we have so in a so war with, the, with, with Tonga. So it's, there is no, absolutely no uh, point of conflict uh, between us uh, and them. None. Zero. Sorry, uh, just, just one second, sir. Um, it's often misremembered. You moderate me. It's, 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 not, <laughs> not, moderate. not you, sir. <laughs> this, sir. Um, it's often misremembered that the antagonism uh, against Russia or the, sort of the, the, the push to conflict with Russia began before the Crimean incursion. Um, the Sochi Games, of course, taking place before, which there were discussions about boycotting um, from, a, from a British point of view and, and other nations. And the way that it is often explained is that because Russia is seen as a, at least a part European country, we, we look at Russia and we see people who look like us. We hold them to a different standard of um, the, the moral mores of our age. So Vladimir Putin is against gay marriage, therefore Vladimir Putin is a bad guy because he's sort of European, but the Saudi royal family can uh, stone people to death, but that's okay because they're not European. Do you, do you think there's any aspect of moral conflict in this? That, that I, I, I don't, it doesn't interest me. I don't, I, I don't, I simply don't, um, or wouldn't begin to regulate uh, the relations of my country with another country on the grounds that I disapproved of its internal policies. That's not what foreign policy is about, and in fact we don't. It's, as I, I think now pointed out three times, our relations, we have many very close and profitable relationships with some of the most disgusting tyrannies on earth. It doesn't bother us. So to claim that the, the despotism of Vladimir Putin influences our policies towards Russia is plainly cobblers. It simply cannot be true. Uh, it is not, it, you, you only need to range to the eastern limits of the European Union to find uh, countries as repressive uh, as Russia, and they're in the European Union, and nobody, com nobody complains about that. So again, the, the fund, as you know perfectly well, as in, and, and, and rightly know, the point that you made about, about the comparison with Saudi Arabia would be ultimately a racialist point, wouldn't it? Saying we, the racism of we don't mind, we don't, we don't mind them doing that because we, we despise it. That. So that, that 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 wouldn't be an excuse either. Let's get away from this. I don't, unless anyone can can, can give me a, a consistent. British position, which, which, which allows us simultaneously to have good relations with the People's Republic of China and Saudi Arabia, uh, and to pose on the world stage as the friends of democracy and freedom. If anyone can explain to me how that can be a consistent uh, position of moral foreign policy, then we have an argument. Otherwise, there isn't one. I, I don't well, really I, want to spend I, very much more time on it. No, fine. I think the, the, the point is simply that we hold into a different set of we see no, as a greater threat. No, that isn't the point. The, the, point, the, point is, the point is that that point is, if I may be brief, bald. 
Yeah, it you, simply you, isn't you, you, what we do. Yeah, but we don't there, have ha, we don't have any such position because we don't have any are, moral foreign policy. There, there we any, don't choose our allies on the basis of liking their internal affairs. Okay. We don't do it. But are there any examples of European looking leaders that we that we work with in that way? It seems to me that the the regimes that we tolerate having those sorts of repressive practices, as some people would say, um, are those that are distant from our own experience. Well, that's a different argument. I'm sorry, I can't, I, I, if you, because it's an argument which you, you yourself know cannot be advanced uh, by any civilized person as a reason for, for varying your foreign policy. We can't say, we can't say we, we, uh, we hold you to an allegedly higher standard because of skin of a different color. Mm. No, we can't say that. No, well, that's, that's not. That, that's, that's not that, doing that. That, that seems to me as what the, a, a leading narrative in the. Well, media. If find me someone who says that, and I'll argue. But until you find me someone who says it, then I'm, I'm stuck. Can I just ask you yeah. on, your, on your very first point and on what you've spoken about this evening? What would it take for the general public to move away from us as world police to, as you're talking about, foreign affairs being not? entangled with the regimes themselves. I should imagine several of our cities being reduced to smoking ruins by Anderson's <laughs> which I do not pose as a joke. This is possible if we continue with the foreign policy which we now have. It is perfectly possible that this country will become the target of the sort of things we have blithely done to them. So do you think it would come to the... I think that would, that would, that be, would, that would be a good moment in which people might say, actually, that's not. that possibly wasn't a good idea. But I, at the moment, as George Orwell said, uh, in, I think, England, or was it the line in England, with the deep, deep sleeve of England from which we will only be jerked by the war of bombs. Uh, we've sunk back into it on that matter. We still think we are a major world power, uh, which is the most astonishing uh, delusion outside a mental hospital I know of. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's your thoughts on Donald Trump pulling out the Paris Climate Change Agreement and the Iranian deal? Uh, well, I think my opinion on Donald Trump is that he is an oaf. Uh, and that I am distressed when I see any educated or intelligent person uh, showing any enthusiasm in fact. Uh, particularly distressed when I see Christian persons showing any enthusiasm for him because he does not seem to me to be of that opinion himself. But leaving that aside, I, I, think, I think Mr. Trump knows that there are symbolic things that he can do to enthuse that particular constituency. And I don't have very much doubt that he, he's cunning. He's a sort of male Princess Diana. He's not very, <laughs> he's not very intelligent or educated. Uh, he can barely read, and he certainly couldn't have got many O-levels, but he is fantastically cunning. And therefore, the cunning, as Princess Diana showed us all, uh, is, will overpower education in most political struggles. And this is, what, this is the most fundamental explanation of what you're dealing with here. So I think the the the, the, um, the the refusal to to sign the Paris Climate Change Agreement, which wouldn't have had any effect on anything anyway, and uh, yes. is is part of the cunning, and the uh, the withdrawal from the Iranian uh, the, the Iranian deal is part of the stupidity. Yes, sir. And um, you've argued quite convincingly that the reasons for our again aggression towards Russia are pretexts and they can't possibly be true, but I agree with you. So what are the actual reasons that we're aggressive towards Russia? Why is it happening? I believe that its roots are in the Middle East. Uh, I, I, I do believe that it is because Russia has frustrated our pro-Saudi policy in the Middle East that uh, a lot of the events in the Ukraine followed. I, it, it seems to me, if you look at the timings of it all, it was when uh, Vladimir Putin began to oppose the, um, the attempt to overthrow Assad that the, the effort to destabilize Ukraine uh, intensified very strongly, and I think the two are probably connected. Um, there, are, there is also there's a very interesting side aspect to this. It's more important in America than here, but still worth bearing in mind. Uh, there's a very good book called Who Lost Russia by Peter Conradi, 
it's good in a number of ways, but one of the things that it does is it, is it, is it preserves in, a, in an easily accessible form two historical events which people are either unaware of, of or have forgotten. During the Clinton era, uh, when the lobby for NATO expansion began, the New York Times, which was then a much more serious and responsible newspaper than it is now, uh, commissioned a reporter to investigate quite how it was the United States Senate was so enthusiastic on NATO expansion and discovered, and the Peter Gon Rally provides the links to this work, discovered that the Senate had by and large been bought by American arms and military equipment manufacturers uh, who had been very afraid that the end of the Cold War would deprive them of their business. It's like some sort of Eric Ambler popular front Cold War thriller in which the wicked arms manufacturers take over the government, but it is absolutely true, it's demonstrably true. NATO expansion was a policy devised by arms manufacturers for their own benefit. The other thing is that George <laughs> Kennan, the father of the Cold War, uh, the American diplomat who in his long telegram began the policy of containment and urged mistrust of the Soviet Union at the highest level and was most enthusiastic about the United States following that policy at a crucial moment, came out of retirement at that same period, in his 90s, still entirely compostmentous, to plead against NATO expansion and to say that it was the most foolish policy which we could conceivably follow, uh, that it would, amongst other things, be a grave insult to all those brave people in Russia who had stood up for democracy and freedom and now found themselves uh, being treated as an enemy by, the, by, by countries from which they were entitled to expect friendship, and also because it would create uh, the very conditions of fear and danger which it purported to prevent. And if you look now at uh, quite a lot of the voices which are pushing for NATO expansion and for the new Cold War, you will find they are linked in various ways to think tanks which are linked in various ways uh, to manufacturers of helicopters and guided missiles and explosive devices. It is as cynical and as crude as that. And this country rolls along with it, it seems to me, because you will always... It, it, I, it's a sad thing. I mean, there are bright people in the military and there are bright people in the Navy and in the Air Force, but there are also some quite thick ones. And they think, uh, they think that uh, th their, their careers will be advanced and they will get more to do and they will get more budgets if they join in this garbage. And I think that is a big influence. The other, the other is it's been, it's been great. I, I've just completed it. It's not a history, it's a study of how this country managed to make such a mess in the Second World War. And one of the things which emerges from this is the immensely important role of stupidity in human affairs. Never, ever underestimate it. There's a lot of it about it, and it never goes away. And one, well, after they abolished the grammar schools, there was a lot more of it. <laughs> George, George W. Bush was generally pro-Saudi in his foreign policy, but he was working very closely on Middle Eastern intervention with Putin right up until after the...